Hey everyone, my name is Faraz. I'm one of the PGY3s. Uh, my talk is going to be on uh, pericardiosynthesis uh, in cardiac tamponade. Um, I wanted to thank everyone who helped me, Drs. Camacho, Chu, Gennaro, Kodakia, Kilpatrick, Kopchak, and Lamb. Um, so the objectives for the lecture, so I want to go over the basics of uh, pericardiosynthesis, go over some of the indi indications, contraindications, uh, complications of the procedure. Um, I want to go over the basics of uh, cardiac tamponade, and we'll learn some different techniques on how to perform a pericardiosynthesis. Um, and then we'll go over some of the literature behind this procedure as well. Uh, so first we'll talk about understanding the procedure. Uh, so what is a pericardiosynthesis? Um, it's basically the aspiration of fluid from the pericardial space um, that surrounds the heart. Um, this procedure in cardiac tamponade can potentially be life-saving. So what are the indications? Um, emergently, uh, a pericardiosynthesis should be performed in any unstable patient with uh, cardiac tamponade, um, any signs of uh, life-threatening hemodynamic changes. Um, as far as non-emergent pericardiosynthesis, um, so this is generally not performed in the emergency department, um, but this is normally done uh, uh, in stable patients for either diagnostic, palliative, or prophylactic reasons. Um, so contra uh, contraindications for this procedure. Um, so there's absolute contraindications, uh, which there are none for this procedure. Uh, in any patient who's hemodynamically unstable, um, you should perform the procedure um, if there's evidence of cardiac tamponade. Um, there are some relative contraindications, uh, some of which include uncorrected, ble uncorrected bleeding disorders, um, as well as traumatic cardiac tamponade. Um, this is kind of questionable because uh, some people recommend that instead of the pericardiosynthesis, uh, in traumatic cardiac tamponade, you should just go for the emergent thoracotomy. Um, the definitive treatment for this, though, is a uh, pericardial window. This is often per performed by CT surgery. Um, so if you're doing a pericardiosynthesis, uh, you should also get on the phone to the transfer center to transfer this patient to where CT surgery is available. Uh, complications. So this procedure isn't benign. There are potentially serious complications that can occur from this. Um, and rates of complications vary from 4% all the way up to 40%. Um, so the, the complications include dysrhythmias. You can puncture any number of arteries, including the coronary arteries or the internal mammary. Um, you can have hemo or pneumothorax. You could have uh, pneumopericardium. You can have liver injury. You can enter the uh, peritoneum. Um, and then you can also have ventricular puncture. Uh, so this picture uh, up here is actually the catheter being placed um, into the right ventricle and it's going through the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the disease. So what is cardiac tamponade? Um, cardiac tamponade is uh, acute heart failure due to the compression of the heart by either large or rapidly developing effusion. Um, so some of the pathophysiology behind it. So basically tamponade exists on a continuum from uh, pericardial fusion all the way up until cardiac tamponade. Um, so what it starts with is you have a pericardial fusion. As the fluid accumulates, you get uh, increased pericardial fluid volume. Um, this in turn leads to increased pericardial pressure, which then leads to increased ventricular filling pressure. And that leads to decreased filling and therefore decreased choke volume. This leads to decreased cardiac output, as well as increased venous pressures. Um, this will then lead to systemic and pulmonary venous congestion. And that's when you get symptoms or signs like rails, JVD, peripheral edema, basically signs of heart failure. Um, the second graph here is basically showing that uh, cardiac tamponade can be a variable of either the rate of effusion or the size of effusion. So if you have a rapidly uh, accumulating effusion, um, volumes as small as 150 cc's can cause tamponade. But if you have a slow uh, effusion, um, because it takes longer to reach the limit of pericardial stretch, um, the pericardial sac can accommodate up to 1500 cc's of uh, effusion. Um, so what are some of the etiologies? What causes these pericardial effusions? Um, so you can have a number of things. Um, you, you have to differentiate between uh, hemopericardium, uh, 
pericardium to non-hemopericardium. So the causes of hemopericardium uh, is a number of things, including trauma. Um, you can have ventricular rupture. This is often after like an MI or something. Um, and there's also iatrogenic causes. So if you misplace a central line, it goes into the ventricle and causes bleeding. That can cause it. Um, for the non-hemopericardium, uh, you can have things like cancer, uh, autoimmune diseases such as lupus. Um, you can have infectious causes like HIV. Um, anything that can cause pericarditis, such as infectious or uremic, uh, post-radiation, and then there's certain medications that can also cause uh, these type of fusions, such as procainamide, hydralazine, phenytoin, and the list goes on. So what are some of the clinical features? Uh, so these patients typically present like how any other patient with uh, cardiac disease presents. So you can have uh, the patient will be complaining of chest pain. They'll be complaining of shortness of breath. Basically, any symptoms of heart failure, so like orthopnea, dyspnea, um, or any signs, uh, symptoms of end organ damage, so dizziness, syncope, altered mental status. Um, these are all ways that uh, patients with cardiac tamponade can present. But normally, they'd be hemodynamically unstable. Uh, but if you catch them early enough, they could still have stable vitals. Uh, so your physical exams. So uh, on physical exam, you can get the classic Bex triad. This is not necessary in any every patient with uh, uh, cardiac tamponade, but the classic teaching is hypotension, JVD, muffled heart sounds. Um, other things to look out for are things that you would see in heart failure, so rails, peripheral edema. You can see a patient have uh, be diaphoretic, have clammy skin. Um, and then another classic teaching is pulseless paradoxus. But, um, this is defined as uh, a greater than 10 millimeters mercury pressure change in systolic blood pressure with inspiration. Um, but very rarely do we actually see this in the emergency department because we don't have A lines ready, readily available in the patient that we're trying to assess. Uh, so a quick and dirty way to assess this is you can put your finger on their radial pulse and ask them to uh, inhale. Um, and uh, you should be able to feel a difference uh, in the strength of their pulse. Uh, so as far as EKG, so you can have a number of things. The most obvious one on this one is uh, electrical alternance. You can see the alternating voltage uh, between QRS complexes. Uh, but another more subtle thing is you can have uh, low voltage. Um, this is due to the space between the EKG leads and the heart itself caused by the fusion. Um, and then other things, you can have non-specific ST changes, you can have sinus tachycardia, just all things to look out for on their EKG. As far as the chest x-ray, so again, this is kind of the obvious, uh, it's called the water bottle sign. Um, this is based on not how our current water bottle looks look like, but I guess the old satchel like water bottles that they used to have. This, um, it's basically an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Um, so things to look out for on the x-ray um, are cardiomegaly, which is an uh, indication of potential uh, cardio, uh, pericardial fusion. Uh, other things that you can see are prominent pulmonary vasculature. Um, so what would you see on the ultrasound? Um, so you can see a number of things. Um, so first and foremost, you would see a pericardial fusion. So like I said before, even a small pericardial fusion can potentially cause uh, cardiac tamponade. It's important to note though that cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis and you don't necessarily need the ultrasound to diagnose, but the ultrasound is definitely very helpful in diagnosing uh, cardiac tamponade. So some of the other things other than the effusion itself you would be looking for um, is diastolic collapse of the right atrium. Uh, you could also see diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. Um, and then other things to look for is a plethoric IBC, uh, which is highly sensitive, but not very specific. Um, so in terms of the effusion that you'd be looking at, so um, uh, I'll show you in this video. So you can see it in the sub xiphoid view, but if it's large enough, you can see it in other views as well. So you can see there's a large effusion around the heart. Um, what you're looking at, you may be seeing the right ventricle. Is it collapsing in diastole? It's kind of hard to tell, especially with the rapid heartbeat. Um, so the way that you can differentiate this to see if it's actually in diastole is you can um, use M mode. So what you would do is you'd place the M mode cursor 
um, through the right ventricle and uh, through the mitral leaflet. Um, so you can see it over here. Uh, so it's going through the right ventricle, through the mitral leaflet. And what you're uh, looking for when you press M mode is you see the right ventricle here, the mitral leaflet here. Every time the mitral leaflet hits the intraventricular septum, uh, that is diastole. So what you would correlate that with is the right ventricle over here. So you can see every time it's diastole, you see the right ventricle kind of collapse. So this is significant for uh, diastolic collapse of the right ventricle. So this would be a big indicator of potential cardiac uh, tamponade. Okay, so performing the procedure. Um, so first and foremost, you need to get your equipment. Um, so what your essential equipment is, is you need your antiseptic solution, uh, which can be chlorhexidine. You need sterile drapes, gown, and a mask. Um, if the patient's awake, ideally you'd have local anesthetic. You need syringes, um, uh, you need a scalpel, and then you need needles. You know, you know, make sure that your needle is large enough to actually reach the effusion. So oftentimes you can use a spinal needle. So this is if you don't have the kit ready. Um, if you don't have the kit, any kit available, those are the supplies you'd gather. And then you'd also get an ultrasound machine. And then if you don't have an ultrasound machine for whatever reason, you can use an EKG and alligator clips. I'll go over that in a second. Uh, but fortunately for us at County, we have some kits available. Um, you can use a, a central line kit if needed, but we also have um, a pericardiocentesis tray. Uh, so a lot of us have seen the pneumothorax tray. Um, it's basically a pigtail catheter. Uh, the pericardiocentesis tray is very similar. The main difference is for the pneumothorax, you have a 14 French catheter. For the pericardiocentesis tray, you have a uh, 8.3 French catheter. Um, these pictures are courtesy of Dr. Beta and his email he sent out a while ago. Uh, if you're looking for these trays, these are uh, located in the supermarket. And if for whatever reason you can't find these trays, like I said, you can use the um, central line kit as well. Um, so talking about the anatomy, so this is a basic picture. You can see the heart behind the sternum. Um, you can just note that there's a space uh, between the third and fourth rib, also the fourth and fifth rib. Uh, to the left of the st uh, sternal border. Um, that's one space, potential space. You can see the apex of the heart here, um, as well as the, um, the xiphoid process right here. Um, and then also in terms of anatomy, so this is the uh, cross-sectional view. You can see the pericardial space down here, um, the liver over here, the xiphoid process. Um, and then note that the diaphragm kind of uh, comes right over here, right beneath the pericardial space. Um, so ideally, if you're doing the sub xiphoid approach, you're supposed to come above the diaphragm, um, below the xiphoid process. Um, and then you can see the sternum up here, the ventricle over here. So the different approaches. So there's three main uh, approaches that you can do the uh, pericardiocentesis. The one that's classically taught is the sub xiphoid approach, which is done uh, between the xiphoid process and the uh, left costal margin. Um, another approach you can use is the uh, apical approach. Uh, and then the last approach is the parasternal approach, which you can do either the left or the right side. Um, in terms of the procedure itself, so it's actually pretty simple. It's if you've done a central line, uh, it's essentially the same steps, right? You uh, enter the, you find the effusion with your ultrasound. Um, you enter it with your needle while holding negative pressure. As soon as you get flashback, you take off the syringe, you uh, insert your guide wire, um, then you take out the needle, dilate, and then and, uh, insert your catheter. So pretty standard uh, Seldinger, Seldinger technique. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the techniques, like I said, uh, ideally you'd have ultrasound. You should always try to use ultrasound with this, given that, like I said, there's uh, is this is not a benign procedure. There's risk for many complications. But if there's a situation where you don't have ultrasound for whatever reason, you can use EKG, and that's preferred to just doing it blind. Um, so the teaching for EKG is um, you would uh, attach your alligator clips to the needle, um, and then the, the other end of the alligator clips is attached to the precordial leads. Um, and then as you're doing the procedure, you can kind of see the changes on the strip. Um, so I'll show it here. 
So here you see the alligator clip is uh, being attached to the needle itself uh, while they're about to perform the procedure. The other end is being attached to the precordial leads. And then while you're doing the procedure, you should see the rhythm strip. And then if you hit the ventricle, you should start seeing ST elevations. Uh, and that's how you know you've gone too far, so you should pull back. Um, so if you don't have that, you don't have ultrasound, then you could do it blind. But the ideal scenario is that you have the ultrasound and you're using that. Uh, so now let's talk about the different techniques. So the first technique is a sub xiphoid approach. Um, so the way you do this is you insert the needle between the, the xiphoid process as well as the less costal margin. You wanna enter it at a 45 degree angle. And then once you're beneath the uh, cartilage cage, you can lower the needle angle to 15 to 30 degrees. Um, and then you're directing it towards the left shoulder. So here's a video. Um, so basically what you have here is CPR in progress. If this is a patient that's in cardiac arrest and cardiac tamponade is the cause, you should stop CPR uh, because the most important thing for this patient is the pericardiocentesis. Um, so you can see them, they're trying to enter at the, um, the between the xiphoid process as well as the left fossil margin. They're talking about entering it at a 45 degree angle uh, and then towards the left shoulder. And then the, the subtle movements that he's doing is they're, they're kind of like jabbing motion rather than like a continuous push. The reason for this is that it's hard to penetrate the pericardium with just a continuous motion. So you kind of want to jab it in. Um, and then this is showing the distance between the needle and the actual space. And then from here, like I said before, once you get the flashback, you essentially do the cell ginger technique uh, by removing the uh, the syringe, then you do the same thing, guide wire, dilator, catheter. So the advantages of the sub te uh, technique, this is kind of the classical teaching, the one that most of us were taught in med school. Um, you have a lower risk of pneumothorax. Um, however, there's many disadvantages of this. Um, you do have the greatest distance uh, to the heart from this. Um, there's risk of liver injury. You can enter the peritoneal cavity. You can cause diaphragmatic injury. And it's often very difficult in obese patients because of the distance. You often don't have a needle that's long enough. So as far as the parasternal approach. So this approach, what you're gonna do is you're gonna enter, uh, the needle insertion site is at the fifth left intercostal space, uh, close to the sternal margin. Um, and you're gonna advance the needle perpendicular to the skin. Um, so what this picture is showing is you have the linear probe. Um, it's right along the left uh, sternal margin. And you're gonna enter it, uh, enter the skin with the needle medially, and you're going to be in plane with the uh, ultrasound. So kind of get the best view from this. You can see on the left side, you see the needle entering the pericardial space. You also note that there's not much distance between the um, uh, the skin uh, uh, to the pericardial effusion. So the advantage of this is you get great visualization with the linear probe. It's kind of the easiest in terms of um, actually walking your needle all the way through. With the sub xiphoid approach and the next approach that I'm gonna to talk to you about, you're using the cardiac probe, which as you can tell, because it's not linear, you kind of distorts the needle and you're not able to walk it all the way through. Um, that advantage, it's, it's much closer um, in terms of getting your needle into the space. The risk of this, uh, obviously you're above the uh, sternum or right next to the sternum, you can cause pneumothorax. But if you go even a centimeter lateral to the sternum, you can risk uh, injuring the mammary arteries. So the last approach is the apical approach. Um, so what you're gonna do for this is the insertion site is one to two centimeters lateral from the apex feet, um, often in the fifth, sixth, or seventh intercostal space. Um, you're going to advance the needle over the superior border because of, of the ribs to avoid the uh, vasculature uh, of the ribs. Um, so we're gonna watch this. So here you see them entering, uh, like I said, you're using the cardiac probe, so you don't get great visualization of the needle. So what they're gonna do 
Uh, you see the uh, pericardial effusion here, obviously the heart, the ventricles over here. Um, because you can't see where exactly your needle tip is, what they're gonna do is they're gonna uh, uh, basically push agitated saline. And what you're looking for is the agitated saline to go through uh, the pericardial space and not the ventricular space. So you see the needle there, and then they're gonna push the agitated saline. So you can kind of see it all around. And the good thing is that it's not in the ventricle itself. And that's kind of how you'd confirm your position. Then you can uh, aspirate from there. And then they're showing the rest of the procedure. So they're aspirating, uh, they have flashback, they're removing the syringe. Um, here they're looking for clots. You can kind of differentiate if it's like traumatic or not based on if there's clots or not. Um, then they're inserting the guide wire. And then the rest of the procedure is essentially what you would expect. So once they have the guide wire in, um, they're going to use their scalpel to make an incision in the skin so that they can introduce the dilator. So this is the dilator going in. And then once they've dilated, now they're introducing the catheter. And then once the catheter's in, they'll take out the, the guide wire. And then that's your procedure. So the advantages of this, um, uh, the apical view is, again, it's a lot closer to the heart than the subxiphoid view is. Uh, the other advantage is if you do puncture the left ventricle, it has like thicker uh, muscle. So it's more likely to heal on its own, even if you do puncture it and then pull back, uh, kind of like collapses on itself. The disadvantages though, is that again, you have a high risk of pneumothorax and uh, the view given that you're using the cardiac probe um, it's kind of harder to track your needle that way. Um, so let's talk about some of the literature. Um, so talking about blind pericardiocentesis, so like I said, this is a benign, uh, not a benign procedure. There's high risks of complications, especially with blind pericardiocentesis. This is actually the study that I showed earlier where the, uh, or the picture I showed earlier with the catheter being inserted into the right ventricle. So you have a uh, risk of ventricular puncture. The, the risk uh, in this study ranged from 20% to 40% of complica uh, for complications. Uh, with a mortality rate of about 6% with blind uh, pericardial synthesis. Um, so this study talked about uh, ultrasound guided pericardial synthesis. Uh, so what they did is they evaluated basically a little over 1,100 uh, ultrasound guided pericardial synthesis from 1979 to 2000. And they looked at uh, overall success rate and complication rates um, using ultrasound to perform this procedure. Um, so what they found is that they had a overall procedural success rate of 97%, meaning that uh, with the ultrasound uh, get, getting, um, uh, reaching the pericardial fusion, they had a 97% success rate. Um, and then they had a complication rate of 4.7%. Um, this is another uh, paper that looked at ultrasound guided pericardial synthesis. They also looked at um, complication rates and success rates. Um, this was a much smaller study. Uh, it was done in Ontario uh, from 94 to 98. And they essentially looked at uh, 46 uh, sonoguided pericardial synthesis retrospectively. They looked at the success rate and it was about 100% and they only had complications in two patients, so about a 5% complication rate. Um, and then this paper, so, they, what they did was uh, they tried to compare the different approaches, uh, parasternal, uh, apical, and sub uh, Was There's not a lot of literature out there in terms of actually performing the procedure to see what the complication rates were. They essentially just looked at patients with pericardial effusions and then they uh, performed ultrasounds on them to determine uh, what they believed was the distance between the skin and the needle. And then they looked at structures in between to determine the approximate complication rate. Uh, it wasn't greatly explained about how they arrived at that approximate accomplish, uh, complication rate. Um, but what they found was that they, they looked at 166 pericardial fusions with ultrasound. They saw that the skin to pericardial fluid, fluid distance uh, for the sub view was about 5.6 centimeters on average. 
um, for the peristernal view was about 2.7 centimeters. And then for the apical view was about 2.5 centimeters. Uh, so they concluded that obviously from the sub uh distance is a lot greater than the other two views. Um, they also predicted based on the uh, structures in between that the uh, predicted complication rates for um, the peristernal, uh, sorry, the sub view was about uh, 79% versus the uh, apical and peristernal views uh, were 31 and 20% respectively. But like I said, this study wasn't the greatest because they didn't actually perform the, um, the procedures themselves. They kind of just uh, had a predicted complication rate. Uh, so in summary, um, basically recognize cardiac tamponade early. It is a clinical diagnosis. You don't necessarily need the ultrasound, but if you do have an ultrasound, it is helpful. Um, understand that there's multiple different approaches to performing this procedure. Um, oftentimes you can use ultrasound to see where the pocket of effusion is biggest and use that way. Um, and when you're performing this procedure, remember that um, the, to avoid the complications the most, use ultrasound. And if you don't have ultrasound, you can use the EKG approach. And if you don't have that, and if you need to, you can use the blind approach. These are my references. And anyone have any questions? Yes, Dr. Jim. As you emphasize, it's important to suspect it. But they may not have the classical findings, especially the muscle part sounds in the next triad. You don't know it yet. You yeah. may not always even get the next thing. And I had a case. Ripped into their pericardium. And because they're also hypovolemic now, as well as you know, going into shock, that they didn't really have the plasma distended neck thing. And by the time we realized what was happening, it was actually too late. Mm. We didn't have a CD surge in it. It was enough to be a mess. So, really want to suspect it early on. And I know more than I do, Dr. Griffith, you have that system. That's a pretty special circumstance, right? Like yeah. That's a patient that you really would not want to be referring to any uh, You may even let them be a little immunized for you and see what they do. The idea is that that your system is leading in so that you may worsen that kind of uh, situation by going to the section. You, you were there with the recent case, uh, Tempano, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess my tidbit about this is that uh, if you are doing a pericardiosynthesis, putting the catheter in is always helpful. But before you start messing around with putting the catheter in, make sure you take some food along. Uh, so that you can get rid of the Tempano and then start worrying about the So for those of you at home, um, Dr. G basically echoed the point that suspect cardiac tamponade early, and then Dr. Willis brought in the point that if you have a uh, cardiac tamponade um, before you disconnect the syringe, make sure you aspirate some fluid off to get rid of the cardiac tamponade and then uh, insert the catheter after. Any other questions? <laughs>